since I was uh, at the beginning of December, actually in late November, Pastor Renee and I were looking together at the at the schedule and and looking at okay, well I'll speak this Sunday and I'll speak that su the next Sunday. And you know we're pretty as pastors we're pretty flexible as we work together, and that's a great thing. That's a great that's a great blessing. And I'll tell you that actually a few weeks ago I knew that I would be speaking uh, for the Christmas Sunday devotion and we always we almost always do something a little bit shorter we're doing a lot of special things on our Christmas Sunday celebration God dropped this thought if you will in my heart uh, really a few weeks ago and as I began to think about it and as I was praying about it and just considering it as we do when we're preparing to, to speak and to preach um, the Lord kept on enlarging it and expanding it and then I looked at scriptures and then studied more and the Lord really confirmed this is what this is what we're going to talk about uh, this morning and I want to talk this morning about the times of Christmas or Christmas time if you want to think about it that way maybe from a different perspective but I trust it's one that will bring comfort and encouragement to your heart this morning as you see and as you're reminded again of how much God cares about you and your life and everything that touches you. Sometimes we feel we're lost in the crowd. Sometimes we feel people don't really notice me or I, I'm, you know, God notices the spiritual ones. I'm not very spiritual. Or God notices those that are at the for forefront, the leaders, those that are involved. But you know, perhaps me, uh, not so much. But as we look at the times of Christmas in the Christmas story as we read it in the Bible recorded by Luke and recorded by Matthew, we're going to see something about God's care for us in the timing of the Christmas story and the timing of our lives. Have you read the stories of the birth of Christ recently? If you haven't yet this Christmas, or if you say, well, we read it this morning in church twice, don't stop there. On your own, would you please go back on your own, go to the Gospel of Matthew, go to the Gospel of Luke. These are the two places where we really read about the Christmas story. The one in Matthew is very short, but it tells us some parts. And then the story that we usually read is found in the Gospel of Luke, and that's what we're going to be looking at mostly this morning. But we're going to begin in Matthew. We're not going to read all of it, but I want us to read from Matthew 1, 18 through 19, and we're going to be talking about timing. Most of this is from the New Living Translation, and it says very simply, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. It's very simple, isn't it? You know, one of the reasons, if you look at this, one of the reasons that I'm so convinced that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is a miraculous book and that this is a miraculous occurrence is that if man had thought this up for something so miraculous and so incredible, it would have been really long with all sorts of details and, and see it's real and it's a miracle and it's this, this, this and this. And the Holy Spirit inspired the writers just to write simply, this is what happened. And so we read, his mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. I want to ask you something this morning. Have you ever wondered about the timing of Jesus' birth? I have especially when I was younger, and I'd look at this and i think, why was it this way? Why did God do it this way? Um, we look at these two young people. Sometimes people say, well, Joseph was older because perhaps he died. We don't know that. Perhaps they were both, uh, for sure, Mary was, was a very young, a young, we would say girl these days. She would have been perhaps 14 years old. Or 15. That would have been about the age when, when she would have married. Joseph perhaps probably was a little bit older. And we look at these two. Obviously, Mary was a good girl, we would say. Joseph was a good man. That's what the Bible says. And they're engaged, they're moral, they're sincere, they're righteous young people. And in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in, those, in New Testament times in those days, if you were engaged, that was the same as being married. In fact, notice here it says, here it says he wants to break the engagement quietly. In Luke it talks about he decided to divorce her. So even though they were engaged, she was going to divorce. Sometimes the engagement would last up to a year as they, and in that period it was a time to show, because the marriages were arranged, I'm faithful to you. 
you are faithful to me. Imagine the horror and the disgrace and the shame when Joseph heard the news that Mary, that young girl his parents had arranged for him to marry, was not a good girl. And that's what we would say these days, right? She was a bad girl. That, that's what we would say, that she had shamed him. Imagine how he felt. We think about that. Before they're married, God has sent the angel Gabriel to Mary to tell her first the news. She's been chosen and favored by God. We read that. And then I want you to think about the timing. God tells Mary first, but he doesn't tell Joseph, does he? Have you ever, that's, that's what I think about. Really, I, I think about these things. It's okay to think about these things. And I kind of wonder, don't you, why didn't God tell Mary and Joseph at the same time? You know, they're both in it together. Both of them, it's going to affect their reputation. Why didn't God send Gabriel and, and on the same night, he tells Mary and he tells Joseph. Mary's going to have a child. The child is going to come from the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't, be, don't worry and don't be afraid. This is my plan. And God doesn't do that. He tells Mary first and Joseph finds out after the fact and he assumes what we all would have assumed if we had been in that town of Nazareth and heard, have you heard about Mary? She was engaged to Joseph, but she's pregnant. And we would think either she slept with Joseph and got pregnant or we would think she slept with somebody else and she got pregnant. But that was God's plan, and that, that was God's timing, and that was God's arrangement. And so as we think about that, what I want you to think about is this. As we look at this first thing, you know what it seems like to me? It seems like to me that God got the timing wrong. Doesn't it seem that way to you? Isn't this, how would you have, a, please don't get shocked. I'm not being sacrilegious. We're being honest this morning. Doesn't it seem like the wrong timing, the way God arranged it? Yes or no? Of course, yes. If I were arranging it, and if you were arranging it, you know what we would do? We would let Joseph and Mary get married, wouldn't we? Of course we would. We would let them get married. But that night, before they slept together as husband and wife for the first time, then God would have sent Gabriel. I'm, I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm being very practical. God, I would have arranged it so that Gabriel would have come and would have said to Joseph and Mary, now, wait because I'm going to give you a child and it's going to be through the power of the Holy Spirit and he will be my son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sin and all of that. That's how I would have done it and you would have done it the same way. But God doesn't do it that way. He does it in a way that seems to be wrong timing, completely wrong timing, not just bad timing, wrong timing. Why do it that way? You and I now in 20, 2015 can look back and we can understand completely and perfectly why God did this, can't we? We understand the timing. We look back and we understand perfectly. God, this is why you did it. God, this is why you allowed it to happen in this way because of your purpose and your plan so that it would be truly miraculous, so that there would be no question, so that in a young father and in a young mother, there would be an obedience and a submission in their lives to the perfect and difficult will of God for them. Because God's will is sometimes difficult, isn't it? It's not always easy. And it requires something of us. But we see in this that it wasn't the wrong timing. It was the right timing. It was perfect timing. So I want to make an application this morning. And I could go on a, a lot more and, and talk about these things. But here's one of the things as we look at the timing of Christmas and the times of Christmas. I want to ask you about your own life. Has something ever happened in your life or maybe you're dealing with something now that in your thoughts and in your in your in your feelings about it you feel God this is wrong God this timing is off it's not just bad timing God this feels like wrong timing and there are things that happen in our lives and we think God why did you let this happen now? You're God. You could have changed it. You could have done something differently. And I don't know about you, but I have struggled at times in my life before. God, this is wrong. This, this is just wrong. Why didn't, you, why didn't you change the time? Why didn't you work it out in a different way? And what I want to suggest to you to this, this morning is that God 
in spite of what seems like wrong timing to you and to me, that just as surely as God was at work in the lives of a young man and a young woman more than 2,000 years ago because he loved them and he had a good and wonderful plan for them, the same thing is true in your life this morning. What seems like wrong timing, God, how can this be? How can this be you? Have you ever thought that? God, how can this be you? That in spite of your questions, in spite of not really understanding, it is God. God is in it. It is not wrong timing, but God is at work. And as you walk with Him, and as you trust Him, God will make it clear. And God will show you it's right. I'm doing something bigger than you understand. I'm doing something miraculous. And I love you and you are part of this plan. I think that's one of the things that we learn as we look at the timing of Christmas. But I don't want to stop there. Let's look at something else. And let's look at the next part, the main part of this Christmas story from Luke, from the Gospel of Luke. Sometimes it's not necessarily wrong timing. Sometimes it's just inconvenient timing. It, there could have been a better time, right? So we look at Luke 2, 1 through 7. And what do we see? We see at that time the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from, from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary. Now look what comes next, especially women who have been pregnant before. His fiance, who was now obviously pregnant, okay? And while they were there, the time came, oh, we're talking about time, for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first child, a son. And she wrapped him snugly, in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And I want us to look at the inconvenient timing of this. In this situation, it's not so much that it's wrong timing, it just seems awfully inconvenient, right? He's God. And in the Old Testament, we read that the heart of the king in God's hands, remember that verse? The heart of the king in God's hands is like a water course or like a stream of water, like in an irrigation channel that God can move any way he wants to, right? It says that in the Old Testament. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. God, where are you? Can't you take the, the heart of Augustus in your hand and move it in a different way? Your son is going to be born into this world. Mary is pregnant. It's not a good time to travel. By the way, those of you who are mothers, I'm sorry, husbands, fathers, sorry, fathers, you know very little about this at this point. You may know more than I because you were married to your wife when she was, when she was obviously pregnant I, and I've not had the experience of either, okay? But those of you who, who are mothers now, think for just a minute. Think about when you were obviously pregnant, okay? I, I like that expression. The Bible's so practical, right? Just say the week before or the days before you were going to give birth, mothers, how comfortable were you? Were you really comfortable? Could you find any place more than about five minutes that was comfortable? No, you couldn't, could you? You turned this way, you turned that way, you sat this way, you sat that way, you slept every which way. And then imagine riding a donkey. I can't even imagine it. Probably, probably they rode a donkey, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, for 80 miles. Can you imagine that? I really, Flora, I just can't imagine that. It's terrible, isn't it? It's really, really terrible. And we look at this and we think, that's awfully inconvenient, isn't it? The heart of the king is in God's hands. Why couldn't he have changed it? Why couldn't he have moved it? And not only that, then they get all the way to Bethlehem and the time comes. You know, those of you who delayed. Mothers, how many of you, the baby was expect, you were expecting the baby at a certain time and the baby was really delayed? Anybody? Three weeks? A month, a long time, right? Couldn't God, who controls everything, couldn't God have delayed, now, now you're laughing, right? But couldn't God have delayed the baby? We're, we're, I'm being really practical because this is a true story. 
Couldn't God have delayed the baby until they got back to Nazareth so that Mary, who would obviously have been inexperienced and young, could give birth when, where her mother was there to help her, where older women were there to help her. I can't even imagine how this must have felt and how this must have been. And those of you who, are, who have had children before, especially your first child, how would you like to be in a dark, cold manger somewhere on your own with only your, sorry men, husband to help? <laughs> it would have been terrible, right? So inconvenient. God could have delayed the baby, but he didn't. And we read, and while they were there, the time came for her baby to born. Doesn't it seem like the wrong timing? But God had a plan, didn't he? He was doing something, and it was in perfect plan. It wasn't inconvenient in God's plan and in God's arrangement. So now I ask you this morning, as you look at your own life, are there things in your life that you feel it's awfully inconvenient, God? Couldn't you have arranged this differently? God, couldn't you have arranged a better time for this to have occurred in my life? You could have put the pieces together a little bit differently. After all, you're God. And yet we see that God, with his own son, as he brought him, as he came into the world, this is how God chose to do it. And it was no mark of lack of love. It was no mark of poor planning. It was no mark of carelessness. It was no mark of oversight in Jesus, the Son of God. The same is true for your life if you feel that there are inconvenient things that are happening. If you're feeling God, you don't tell other people, but in your heart, in your inside voice, in your inside thoughts, you kind of blame God, don't you? God, you could have arranged it better. And yet God has chosen to do it this way. Brothers and sisters, could you accept this morning that if God would work that way in the life of Mary and Joseph, who were highly favored, who were chosen by him as objects of favor and love, that he might be doing the same thing in your life as well? It's not something wrong or out of place or out of time, but God has a purpose and a plan in your life. Let's look at something else. Um, let's look at the shepherds. And let's look at Luke 2, 8 through 9. We've already read this part of the story. The time has come. Mary has just given birth that night, has wrapped him in strips of cloth and put him in a manger. And we read in Luke 2, and 8, 9, 2 8 and 9 that that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And then the angel of the Lord appears. Now I want to tell you something. This part of the story doesn't even seem like it's just kind of a coincidence, right? It doesn't even seem like part of the big plan of the story. It just seems like, well, that's, you know, there were shepherds in the fields. Is, isn't that logical? Bethlehem, there would be shepherds in the fields. It was an agrarian area. Uh, Bethlehem was known for very fertile fields and for flocks of sheep. Did you know that? In historical agricultural records. And so that just kind of seems like, a, well, of course it was that way. That was just a given. That was just a coincidence. But I want us to see something here. And I want you to think about those fields. Think with me about the shepherds staying in the fields nearby. If you go back in the Old Testament, do you know what you will find as you go back in the no Old Testament? These were the fields where Ruth gleaned from the land of Boaz. Yes, all the way back. These fields, these fields, because Boaz was of the house, Boaz was of Bethlehem, and Ruth would be one of the ancestors of Jesus. She gleaned in those fields. But that's not the only thing that happened in those fields. Do you know who else was in those fields as a shepherd, watching over his sheep, taking up his harp, singing, composing songs of praise to God that we still sing and say today? David the shepherd, and then David the king. And Bethlehem was called the house of David, the, the village of David, the city of David. These were the fields where the shepherds were, not so much a coincidence, is it? Not so much a coincidence. And so we look at that, what seems to be a coincidence in the timing of this Christmas story. Because you know what? There were not always shepherds in this fields. If you look at the historical records, 
of Bethlehem and of that area. There were times when there were no shepherds in the fields. In the dry seasons, they were taken to other places. In the cold times and in the wet part, wet times, they would have been in the, in the rainy season. They would not have been out in open fields. They wouldn't have been there. But this night, not by coincidence, they were there. They were there. And it was to these shepherds that the angel of the Lord appeared and said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For today, for tonight is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior. Let's look at the, uh, the next slide. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And don't be afraid. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem. And you will recognize him. Now, I want to tell you something else about what seems to be coincidence as we look at this this morning. It seems like coincidence, but it's not. The Lord arranged that it was at this time Jesus would be born. And he would be born in Bethlehem. And he would be born in a manger. And the first people to get the birth announcement that night were shepherds. Brothers and sisters, this wasn't any old time. These weren't any old fields. These were not any old shepherds. Because when were the shepherds in the fields? They were certain to be there. We don't know exactly because it's a long time ago, but it's very likely. These were the shepherds who were watching over the sheep that would be sacrificed at the temple because the sheep of Bethlehem were used for that purpose. And in lambing season, when the sheep came, when the, sh when the lambs were born, the shepherds would always be there to watch over the sheep. And then they would examine, especially the firstborn lambs. They would examine them because the firstborn lamb especially. They were sacrificed at the temple, especially at Passover. No coincidence, brothers and sisters, because the angel of the Lord says, to you is born this day in the city of David. Who was born? John said it when he saw Jesus years later, when Jesus was 30 years old, John the Baptist saw Jesus. Do you remember what he said when he saw him? Behold, what did he say? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, when I read that, when I understand that, my heart is filled with over, overwhelming thanksgiving and joy. No coincidence in the timing. No coincidence in the, place, in the placement of it. But God chose that time. God chose that place. God chose those shepherds because those shepherds knew the sheep, the lamb that will be sacrificed. He's born in these fields. He goes to the temple. He's sacrificed to God for the sins of the people. And God himself had it arranged and timed so that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be born in Bethlehem and he would be offered at Passover for the sins of the world, for the sins of you, for the sins of me. That's the timing of God in your life and my life. Not a coincidence, but at just the right time, at perfect time, and for the sake of time, there's more I could say, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip part of it. I'm going to skip Simeon and Anna. Maybe we'll do them another time. But I want us, um, Andreas, go to slide. Um, go, to, go to slide eight. Go to slide eight. The perfect timing. The perfect timing. So what did we just hear? And what, we, what did we just see? In the timing of God, it wasn't a coincidence. Do you sometimes feel things are coincidences in your lives? Things just happen? God has a perfect timing. His hand is upon you, and his hand is upon your life. If God would perfectly orchestrate that Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, takes away your sins and my sins at just the right time, at just the right time. You see, brothers and sisters, those shepherds, do you know what one of their responsibilities was? It wasn't just to watch over all the lambs at night, to watch over all the sheep at night. Do you know what, what their other responsibility was when we read that? They would look at the lamb that was born 
and they would examine this lamb. Is it a perfect lamb? Is it suitable for sacrifice? So when the angels announced, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this is the sign, you will find him. And the shepherds go running off to find Jesus. What do they do when they see Jesus, the Lamb of God? They're the first ones to look. If you will, they're the first ones to examine this Lamb of God that has been born. And he's the perfect Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And then, long after Jesus has been crucified, has been buried, and has been raised and returned to heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit, Paul writes about the timing of Christmas. You say, Paul writes about the Christmas story? Sure he does. And we read in Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the right time came, don't you like that? When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman. Oh, Mary, that goes back to the timing at the beginning, right? Subject to the law. Verse 5, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. There was no other way. That's why Jesus had to be born through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus had to be born of Mary. That's why the timing was what it was, because it was the right time, and God sent His Son. But that's not all. There's another part of the Christmas story as well, and it's in Romans. And we read in Romans 5, 6, When we were what? Utterly helpless. Christ came at what? just the right time and died for us sinners. Because you see, brothers and sisters, that's part of the Christmas story as well. I, I want to say something to those of you who perhaps are not Christians or you're here visiting this morning or you say, well, I've heard the Christmas story. Yeah, you know, I see this nativity scene. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. I want to say to you and I want to remind all of us again this morning that you can't just start a story and stop halfway. Isn't that disappointing? You've start, have you ever started a story and you didn't get to finish it? God finishes the story for us because the whole part of the story of Christmas is he came just at the right time and then he died for us. That's part of the story. It's part of the story and it was at just the right time. This morning, as we come to the end, it's just the right time. It's just the right time. Let's go to the last slide. At just the right time, Jesus came. This morning, as the choir sang, we sang, Come the long-expected Jesus, the words of Charles Wesley, this longing of the heart. And I want to offer to you this morning and suggest, not just suggest, but say to you this morning, that Jesus has come this morning and is here with us today. And I want to give you the opportunity, if you have not, to say this morning, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room for you here. There's room for you here. You say, well, I don't know a lot about it. You don't have to know a lot about it. You may say, ah, oh, sorry, Pastor, my life is really a mess. You don't know what I'm involved in. You don't know what's going on. Hey, Jesus was born in a manger. You know how dirty and smelly and stinky that was, don't you? Some of you this morning are Christians, but your life has gotten kind of messed up along the way. And I say to you again this morning that Jesus has come and he is here. He has come at just the right time when we're helpless, when we're messed up. He's come at just the right time. The timing of God is perfect in your life. He's perfect in your life. Would you just close your eyes with me? And we're just going to take a moment. We're just going to pray very simply. And if you want to invite Jesus in your heart this morning, we're going to do that right now. And if some of you say, but I'm not sure, you can do it again. God, we thank you for sending Jesus at just the right time. At just the right time. And Jesus, this morning, I invite you to come into my heart. I invite you to come into my life. I don't understand everything and I still have questions. But Jesus, I understand enough this morning 
to know that you have come to change my life if I let you come in, if I invite you in. And so this morning, Jesus, come into my life and I give you my life and my heart. Would you change me? Would you bring me into the family of God, just as we read, brought into your family and make my life different? Thank you, Jesus, for coming in and making a difference. Lord, for others of us here this morning, we have been struggling with your timing and circumstances in our lives. We have secretly blamed you, and we have said, God, why couldn't you have worked this out? God, why couldn't you have done it differently? And Lord, it's really frustrated us. But God, this morning, we come to you humbly again. We do. And we just surrender to you, and we submit to you. And, and Lord, we want to say and agree that your timing is perfect. We see that. It's not wrong. It's not inconvenient. It's not coincidental. But you have a good timing in our lives. If you worked that out for Jesus as he came into this world, you can work things out in our lives. Forgive us for doubting you, for not trusting your plan. Help us to walk with you and set our eyes upon you and trust that you are working all things for good in our lives. For at just the right time, Jesus came. And at just the right time, you are working in our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.